You are so beautiful to me. Don't you just love that song? Yeah. You are so beautiful to me. It, um, It, the song is designed for a romantic couple, You Are So Beautiful to Me. But I chose that song to start this evening off with because, because it, has a, it can have a broader meaning than that. Not just between romantic partners, but between everyone. You're everything I hope for, you're everything I need. You are so beautiful to me. Now, we're going to hear that, that little vignette a time or two before this presentation is over. Because love is what it's all about, okay? Now, you look at the PowerPoint slides up here, and you see we're talking about a new psychology. We're going to be thinking outside the box. I, I got to tell you straight up, I'm going to do a real number on your belief system here, okay? <laughs> so you need to be ready for this. We're going to question every single belief you've ever had, all right? And I mean that literally. We are going to think not outside the normal box. And let me describe what I mean by that. The normal box is, well, we've, we've got an idea here, and so, so let's think about it a little bit differently. And oh, we see now we can do something else with the idea, and that's thinking outside the box, and that's the way we normally think of things. In fact, the whole field of energy psychology, thanks to Roger Callahan, actually came from the idea of thinking outside the box. Therapy actually can uh, and should uh, combine with the acupuncture meridian system. Thinking outside the box, you are all outside the box thinkers or you wouldn't be here. You have taken the slings and arrows of your doubting clients over time, I'm sure, <laughs> as I have. Um, now, where was I? <laughs> so, so, yeah, but we're, we're going to think outside the box that contains all the other boxes. That's how far we're going, okay? And what I mean by that is we're gonna think outside of the sensory box. The box, see, the world that we see, the world that we live in uh, uh, is reported to us through our senses. We see it, we hear it, we feel it, we smell it, we taste it, and so on. And that's how we know it's there. And so what we're gonna explore here is what's outside of that, okay? And obviously we're getting into spiritual areas here. We're going to be talking about uh, the latest science, quantum physics. We're gonna be talking about spiritual things. Uh, I happen to be a, an avid uh, uh, student of A Course in Miracles. We'll be talking about that some. And we're gonna put all this together in a way that hopefully is going to open some, some incredible doors. I, I'm hoping by the time we're done, you're gonna walk out of here with a whole different set of thoughts about what therapy in the world you know, is all about. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a very old um, metaphor about thinking out of the box, and that's the one you've all heard of and you've all talked about many times probably, and that's the flat earth thing. So let me do a little thing here. Ah, the world is flat. I'm not going to be trite here. We're going to talk about stuff you already know for a bit, but I'm going to do something different with this. I'm going to take this in a little different direction, so we need to put a few things in place as we go along. So, many centuries ago, the people thought the world was flat, obviously. But what's important to recognize is the reason they thought it was flat is because their senses told them that. They stand on the seashore, they look out at the ocean, it appears to the senses flat, okay? Um, and the earth is flat. It's got some mountains on it, but basically it's it's flat. Okay? So the senses tell us that, but what happens is scientists came along, they've done some measurements and stellar stuff and all that, and, and um, come to find out, they believe it's not flat, but it's round. Okay? What's interesting is I, I was doing a little study on this, and I always thought, you know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, you know, and that's about the time people really got the idea, well, maybe it's round because they're going around the world, and Columbus and his boats and all of that. Uh, 
But actually, scientists as long ago as the 6th century BC, which is 2,600 years ago, uh, ancient Greeks were, were positing that the world was round. But see how long it took for science to come in finally and show us that the world is round instead of flat? Beliefs are very hard to overcome. So what science finds then, after a while, is that the world is not flat. We found that our senses deceive us, and in fact, the world is round. Okay? And so that is our current belief. Anybody here not believe the world is round? Anybody here believe the world is round? Oh, come on. <laughs> Anybody here believe the world is round? Thank you. You are so beautiful. <laughs> um, so, but we are aided, we are aided with our senses now by scientific discoveries. And since we've had spaceships and satellites go up and take a picture back of the Earth, as you see here, the world is indeed round. We see it with our senses. We know that it's round, don't we? Okay. We're going to go something different with this because the world is not flat and the world is not round. Are you ready for this one? Are you ready for this one? <laughs> what is the world? It doesn't exist. <laughs> well, you laugh, okay? And I don't blame you because, because, come on, Gary, you're telling me the world doesn't exist? I'm sitting here in the world listening to you. I'm in a building which is on this world and I'm on a planet and I'm glued to this to the floor by gravity which came from this planet. This world has oceans in it. I know it does and everybody in this room that I talk to will agree with me that there is a world. Clearly there's a world. You're telling me there isn't a world. And that's the new scientific findings? That's a little tough on the belief system, okay? It's a little tough. Okay. But that's where we're going, so stay with me. The world doesn't exist. It is an illusion. What I'm doing here is giving you a, a kind of a preamble to where we're going today. I'm kind of giving you an introduction to it. I'm kind of giving you the highlights. You know, we're going to get into the why of all this as I unfold this. But it's an illusion. It's something that we have made up. Pretty powerful, aren't we? Our senses deceive us. We are, we, are, we are saying the world is here because our senses report that to us, and that's very clear to us, okay? However, as quantum physics tells us, there is no out there, out there. I'm looking at all the doubting faces out there, you know? You see, how can there be no out there, out there if you are in there looking at me out, out here? Okay. Can't possibly be, can it? Okay, but the findings are there is no out there, out there. This is something like the people who believe in the flat Earth. It took a very long time for science finally to come around and say, "Oh no, it's round." Before we finally believed it, had to have pictures, had to have everything. Okay, but these findings are relatively new, a few decades old, uh, but they certainly haven't made mainstream. Our reality is actually spiritually based. We are not, excuse me, we are one, we are not separate. That's really tough. God is that tough. You look around you and, you, and all you see is separate bodies. You, we, we, you and I both uh, exist inside these little frames called, called bodies. Um, and we look out, say so we see other, other bodies, and they, those bodies are different than, our, than than we are. They have different beliefs, they have different bank accounts, they have different names, they have different genders, they have different all kinds of stuff. No two are the same, but yet we're, we're talking here about we're all being separate. That's all part of being the illusion. These all point to a new paragram or a new psychology. I put quotes around the term new because, because while I'm pounding the table here for these ideas, um, they're not really new. The whole idea that, that uh, we are spiritually based and not body based, I mean, that's at the centerpiece of many, many religious disciplines, okay? Many spiritual disciplines out there. So in that sense, it's not new. What I'm trying to do is put this together 
with some of the latest findings in it and give angles to it that allow us to grab onto it a little better and use it in a way with our clients in therapy practices that will take us to new levels. Now, two years ago, I retired from my large um, EFT site called emofree.com. And at the time, I said I was going to um, explore higher levels of healing. And that's precisely what I'm doing here and why I'm standing here today. But uh, what I want to do is to remind you of something, those of you who read that retirement blog, of two points that I made at the end. EFT has two important features. One of those is what EFT does, and the other is where it points. And what I want to do here is I want to read to you um, what I wrote, just as a reminder. It said, the future, where to from here? EFT has two important features. One, what it does, and two, where it points. The vast majority of EFTers are fascinated by what it does and are forever delivering oohs and ahs as EFT does its magic. And, and by the way, I'm talking about EFT here, and as you know, that's what I represent and, and so on. I realize there are other disciplines out there, but the concepts we're talking about will, will, be, will be parallel throughout all of them. So allow me to use the EFT term because I'm more familiar with it. So I say, this is fine. However, that is nowhere near as important as where it points. EFT is but the doorstep to a far grander palace of possibilities. EFT is way outside our normal experience and its results cannot be properly explained by medicine or conventional science. As remarkable as it now seems, EFT is actually a toy that will someday be tossed away as a mere introduction to the exquisite beauty that is our birthright. It points to a future mental state where disease, war, resentments do not exist. This level cannot be reached, however, by more tapping points. It cannot be reached by the latest and greatest options for delivering EFT or any of the other varied offerings that have found their way onto the EFT scene. Instead, it will require a new approach, a new way of thinking that may or may not be directly related to EFT. I will be exploring the upper reaches of this healing high rise and have my sights on the penthouse. Perhaps we will meet there someday. So that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. And what I want to do now is go through what I call the persuasive pointers to a new paradigm a new way of thinking about this, a, a way of injecting these newer findings into the reality and the practicality of what we're doing. And the first thing, I, you know, I have several things there. EFTs on the upper left-hand corner, so I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with that. Uh, we've already covered the point that EFT and the, and the several energy psychology techniques out there have already uh, taken us outside the normal box of thinking. But there's something we do with EFT that some of you are doing and others haven't done, and I wonder if we quite give it the weight it deserves, and that has to do with surrogate EFT. So what, I'm gonna, what I've done here, I, a few years ago I did a, a workshop and we were experimenting with uh, surrogate EFT, that is, I tap on myself in behalf of the client who doesn't tap at all, just sits there. And they can either sit across from me, by the way, or they can be 3,000 miles away, it doesn't matter. Um, and so we were experimenting with these things. And what I want to do here is show you a one and a half minute little video. This is Bobby, and, and Bobby uh, came up as a volunteer. One, two, that works. Where, where, was I, where did I leave off when I was so rudely interrupted? <laughs> uh, so anyway, anyway, uh, Bobby came up on stage. She had a major back pro lower back problem. It was, it was a zero to 10 scale. It was an eight to nine all day long. It had been that way for several days. And she even worried about coming to this workshop uh, because she didn't want to have to sit through it because it was too difficult on her back. 
But she came anyway, and I saw her, and I said, well, come on, come on up, let's deal with it. So I dealt with it for a little while, but I want to show you this one and a half minutes, and, and please notice, she is not doing any tapping whatsoever. She is just sitting there. And notice the result that she gets. But I, the really important thing is, I'm doing the tapping on me, and she's getting the results. How can that happen if we are indeed separate? Do we not have to be connected in some fashion for this to occur? So, let me give this a little example. My first evaluation of the middle and the right side is that, whoops, nope, there's no change. If anything, if anything, that middle went back up. Uh huh. That nerve thing off to the right. Okay, so it's back up right. to 80s, 90s? Yeah. Okay, all right. Even though I had this middle back thing. Yeah. Okay. I deeply and completely accept myself. There's a reason it's there. Mm -hmm. I may not know what it is. Maybe I do. But there's a reason it's there. And it's probably not because my back is defective. See, I, I just get to say what I want to say. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this middle back thing. Did I say it right? Yes. So you don't you need to have terms that mean yeah. something to them. This middle back thing. This middle back thing. This remaining 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 middle back thing. All right, check it out again. Tell me what's happening. Well, I'm not finding that middle. Oh, it went sharp to zero. Thing. It went to zero. Yeah, you know, I can feel the the uh, the things popping. Uh, you know, your back. You know, kind of. Yeah. You know, the disc are kind of moving moving about, which is wow. which wasn't happening before. You screw up great. my experiment. Because <laughs> I had I had another level in mind. You had another level in mind. <laughs> well, I'm just tickled pink that that middle thing, which was the sharpest kind of the nerve pain thing, I'm not finding that, Gary. Okay. So, that surrogate tapping. You have to ask yourself, how can that possibly happen unless there is some kind of connection for us? Now, uh, the senses don't see any kind of a connection like this. This is outside the senses where this happens. But we see, we see the results, so now our senses see something about that, so we can start to put something together. Something is going on somewhere, somehow. Uh, I, have, I have also done this, uh, I was in Los Angeles a while back, and I had about 80 people in the room, and I asked the 80 people, of those 80 people, how many had some issue they wanted to work on? And I asked for a physical issue, because it's a little easier to demonstrate. And about 60 of those put their hands up, okay? So what I did was I said, okay, you guys just sit there. I will leave the room, and I will tap for all of you. I'm going to fix all of you, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and so, okay. So they did, and they, uh, they, whatever they did in the room, they talked or whatever, and I went outside the room for about five minutes, you know, da, 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 and I, I was, tr it's very difficult to be specific when you're dealing with, you know, all these people, because you don't know what their issues are and what they're hurting for, but I would do, I would do things uh, to try to be specific, even though I have this pain in my body. Now, that's not exactly specific, but it's, uh, I'm getting there as well as I can. And even though it hurts, and even though I might even have an emotional reason behind it, and I was doing all of these things, trying to, cover as best I could 60 different issues. <laughs> and so I came back in, five minutes later, there they were, and I asked them, I said, well, uh, of you 60 people, how many of you uh, had a noticeable improvement? And about 50 of the hands went up. Okay. Interesting. Now that's me outside the room. Okay, they're sitting there talking to each other, they're not tapping at all. They don't even know what they, they know what I'm supposed to be doing. They don't know what I was really doing. Okay, uh, and they get these results. There was one lady in the front row. I remember she was astonished because she had a there was a pain right be, right beneath one of the breasts that had been there for years and it was always at a four, 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 always at a four, always. Okay, gone, completely gone. And I happened to talk to her a couple of weeks later on the telephone, still gone, okay? Interesting, okay? But the point is, the point is, how does that happen? How is that possible unless we're somehow connected? And that's, that's the message here. How is it possible unless we are not separate and somehow connected? Okay, we're back now to our little organization, if you will. 
And if you look up there at the top, it says accepted science. So I want to go through a few things, and I'm tiptoeing into this, but we're going to get into deeper and deeper stuff as we go along. Um, but there are, there are things about accepted science that we have known for years about this general topic. And one of those is the fact that, that our senses are extraordinarily limited. For example, uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum, all we see of it is, is, a, is a small part. Like, like if the entire electromagnetic spectrum uh, uh, spanned the distance but from Los Angeles to New York, some 3,000 miles, the amount of that electric, electromagnetic spectrum that we see is the length of your arm. Okay, That's how tiny a piece of the entire electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can see, that our eyes perceive. Uh, now, we have science comes along and says, well, no, we've got, we got, we got other gadgets. We can see infrared and ultraviolet. That's the, you know, the extreme ends of these things. Uh, so we know they're there. And so we can do some scientific stuff with them and so on, and, and all that's fine. But our senses don't see it in everyday life. We don't know what 99.9999% of what we could see uh, if our eyes would allow us. We don't know what's really going on there. And yet, we have a phrase that we use with some frequency. It's called, seeing is believing, right? I saw it with my own eyes, you know? <laughs> and if you do that, that gives it credibility to you because you are, you're, you, are, you are giving weight to something that your senses tell you about even though your senses are extraordinarily limited. Hearing is the same way. Just to use a simple example, dogs hear things we can't possibly hear. But that's just the beginning of it. I mean, there's a big wide sound spectrum and our ears only hear so much of it. And we only feel so many things and taste so many things and so on. So the point is, our, and we learned this, by the way, in roughly age 17 in school someplace, okay? So I, I didn't tell anybody they, something they didn't know at this point. But we sort of take it for granted. What, what are you going to do about it? I mean, so you can't see 99 or ex experience 99.99 whatever percent of all of this stuff, and all you experience is what your senses will tell you. What are you going to do about it? Well, nothing. I mean, what can you do about it? You, your senses tell you what's there. You use your senses. You get, get around through the world and so on, you know? But in addition to that, uh, and this you may not have learned you know, at age 17, but if you st study science beyond that, you would find that our scientists have discovered not the three dimensions we're used to, plus time, that makes four dimensions. They've discovered 11 dimensions. And we have no way of knowing what the other seven are. We have no sensory data. We have nothing. And yet all this stuff is going on way outside of our ability to comprehend. It's way out there, okay? So we only experience a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the possibilities out there. And because that's all we have, that's, that's all that works for us, we give it all the weight and we conduct our lives accordingly, but don't pay attention to what's outside. <laughs>